Well, good evening and welcome welcome to Country Bible Church. I'm glad that you are live streaming this evening. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to prepare ourselves this evening in our usual way, and that is by having a few moments of silent prayer. And during that time, we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are in control of all things, that you are the sovereign of the universe, and you have everything under control. And you are righteous and you are just. You're also full of grace and mercy. And we thank you for all the opportunities that you give us in order to, first of all, believe the gospel and then grow in grace and knowledge. And all of it is because of your grace. In fact, that is our contact point with you is your grace. And we're so thankful for that. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're going to start this evening looking at the condition of our country right now. And I'm not talking about the coronavirus. You'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Some of you have heard of Todd Starnes. He's a writer for a World Net Daily, among other uh, areas. And he wrote something that I think is important for us to remember and to be focusing on. Then I have uh, three little notepads here, little pages I want to add to it after I read this. And I just pick out certain parts that I think are most relevant and that I like, and that's what I'm going to go over here. Well, it was written by Todd Starnes, and it came to me in an email today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our civil liberties have been stripped away because of what the medical experts told our government leaders. Now, that's what we are facing currently, and we've been facing a lot of things, but we are finding out now, by the way, when I'm looking up like this, that means I'm just just talking to you. I'm not reading, so just just I can't memorize all this. So when I look up and I'm talking, I'm just adding my points here. So the people trusted the government and the expert advisors to get us in a position where we would be best to be able to survive the things that were coming at us. And as it turned out, they were horribly wrong on so many things. And so, and this, this is what actually Todd Starnes is addressing first sentence. Our civil liberties, and by the way, I don't like the term civil liberties because that really doesn't give them the gravitas that they deserve, and that is these are our God-given rights. Now, doesn't that really resound much stronger than civil liberties? But anyway, he says our civil liberties have been stripped away because of what we, what the medical expert told our government leaders. Democrat overlords are hesitant to relinquish their control. They have tested of tasted of the power to decide who gets to plant a garden and who gets to surf in the ocean, among other things. And this is so blatant, I don't know how anyone could not see that this is going on. They have become intoxicated by the authority they have to suspend civil liberties. Now, I like Todd Starnes, but I... He says something here that I have to take issue with. Again, I'll read it to you. They have become intoxicated by the authority they have to suspend civil liberties. I'm not telling you right now, and I'm going to go to a lot more depth in that in a little bit. They do not have, they don't have, nor does anybody have the authority to suspend our civil liberties. 
This is a bedrock foundation of our country that was in, enshrined in the, first of all, the Declaration of Independence and then in our Constitution. And even T Todd Starnes putting it in this way underscores the fact of how many people think that is possible. Any time they try to suspend our civil liberties, then they have exceeded their delegated authority. They have become, become liars. They have broken their oath to the Constitution. And there are our obligation to obey whatever they would say or do is no longer existing. When they are within their delegated power, every person is to obey that. And they cannot suspend civil liberties. So he says, they have become intoxicated by the authority, which they do not have, I would say, to suspend our God-given rights in order and they order jackbooted thugs to shut down churches and appliance stores. Americans don't want a monthly check in the mail. We want to stand on our own two feet. But that cannot happen when state governments deploy an army of health workers and building inspectors and police to shut down our privately owned businesses, which has happened. It's been over a month now. And... We are in dire straits at this point. The only way to stop this economic death spiral is for every freedom-loving citizen to embrace their constitutional rights. Now, I like that part. What does it mean to embrace our constitutional rights? First of all, you have to know what they are, and then to embrace them means that you exercise your constitutional rights. Now, one might ask, well, how do we exercise our constitutional rights? Well, you decide if whatever the government uh, official is requiring, whether it is constitutional or not. And that's not hard to do. Because if something that any government official does is not specifically stated in the Constitution, they don't have that right period. And that means that the authority that they have is now null and void because they are trying to, they're going beyond their authority. And anytime someone goes beyond their delegated authority, there is no obligation for them to be obeyed. So again, he says, the only way to stop this economic death spiral is for every freedom-loving citizen to embrace their constitutional rights. Take to the streets and demand that the state leaders reopen this nation. The time has come for our gun-toting, Bible-clinging patriots to rise up with a mighty voice and declare that this great American experiment is worth saving. I agree with him. Now that's, I could have made this about twice as long, but I just wanted for you to see the gist of what he's saying. <clears throat> I've been watching the news and I've been uh, on the internet looking, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to keep myself abreast of what's happened. And I don't know if everybody knows how serious a condition that we're in. I'll give you the first example. Facebook has taken it upon themselves to take anyone that is trying to promote a protest through Facebook and they're kicking them off Facebook and they say this is misinformation and you're not allowed to do that. And Mark Zuckerberg, I heard him say that we're, we're, we're kicking them off because it's misinformation. That sounds, it sounds like something the Nazi stooges would say. Does he not know that the right, of the, or the, the God-given right of speech, that we can say anything that we want to, and that 
in the First Amendment also is the right to peaceably assemble. Does he not know that those rights are sacrosanct? That's the first thing that the people of this country put in the Bill of Rights. The freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, the freedom to assemble, the freedom of the press, the freedom to... Um, What's the, what's the word? I can't. It's, it's the old timey uh, to make make your grievances known to the government. Does he not know they exist? And he just this is one man. You're getting kicked off of there because I don't like what you're saying. It's misinformation. How does he get by with that? How come he is not sued a thousand times a day? Well, you can look at the Congress for that. But the Congress has made it, given him special, not only him, but Twitter and, um, what's the other one? Um, Twitter and Facebook and, you know what it is? <laughs> well, anyway, we're talking about the tech companies. Facebook, uh, 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 YouTube. Anyway. The reason they're not sued is because they bought the Congress. And the Congress pass, uh, passes laws or <coughs> exempts them from being sued, even though they should be in the category of other business, that they can be sued as well. So the Congress, as they 99% of the time are, either do nothing or what they do is shameful. So they get by with that. And that's why there are no lawsuits, because they are protecting them. And can you imagine, how, how you, if I was a Congress, in Congress, and I heard what Mark, Mark, Mark uh, what's his name, Zuckerberg said, I'm kicking you off because you're giving misinformation, because you're trying to exercise your First Amendment rights. So I, I don't agree with it, so I'm kicking you off. And they sit there on their hands and do nothing? A woman in New Jersey was arrested and charges were filed against her because she was organizing a protest against the governor. And so the governor just sent his goons out there and arrested her. Another thing in New Jersey, there are mayors that are using unmanned drones to spy on the people to make sure that their edicts are not being disobeyed. And I saw pictures of them. I saw videos of them going around spying on the people. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio has ordered small, <coughs> excuse me, 8 million people to snitch on their neighbors. He's ordered them to do so. And he even pays for that as well. And it's very interesting because he said that if you're in a place and they're not practicing social distancing, you take a picture and send it to us, give us the address, and we'll be out there. And they're finding these people $1,000 for breaking this mayor's, and I said, edict. It doesn't have anything to do with the Constitution or law. And there was a person on TV that I saw, she was a journalist, and she called and said, I'm over here in, by the subway station, and I'm calling in about people who are not social distancing. They were homeless people. And she said they, they are make, they're a worse threat and more dangerous than anything, any other people that are around. She took pictures of it and sent it to them. And of course, they didn't come out. And they responded to her email by saying, you need to call the metro or whoever it is that is in charge of the subway. Now, why weren't they interested in going and cleaning up that hazard? They don't have a thousand dollars. There's no money in it. The meaning's job is to 
report this kind of abuse from our leaders, from our officials, but not only do they not uh, uh, report it, they approve of it and they celebrate it. Now, this is insane. Do they not know that the only reason they are able to exist is because of the First Amendment, the freedom of the press, and yet they are attacking that same First Amendment? That's insane. But they have ulterior motives. They would do anything. This is small potatoes what they will do in order to get the president out. And they are shameful. The things that are happening in our country could not happen if we had even just a neutral media. The general media are corrupt to the core. They give nothing but propaganda and they lie. The things that they should be reporting, for instance, uh, our president signed a, a, a executive order about our oceans to keep them clean. You never heard of that, did you? Because that's something that the people might like and they don't want to do that. They are shameless. They are the dregs of society. I can't tell you how evil they are. Joy Behar is on The View. You may have heard of her from before. She should be in the media because she's about fitting for that ilk. And she said yesterday that more of our rights should be abolished. That's a quote. And she said that exercising the Second Amendment, meaning being able to bear arms, should be considered a felony. Now she... As much as you hate that, she has the right to say that. But did the, anyone take her to task over that? Well, Tucker Carlson did. And there's a few in the media that are not only honorable, they're heroes, but they're extremely rare. <clears throat> America trusted the government experts concerning virus, and like I said before, they didn't come through. And we are in the position now that we are at the brink because of what these mayors and these governors have done, making these so-called um, declarations and expecting everybody to obey it. This would be a good point for me to tell you about. They do it through executive orders. I looked up executive order. This is the definition from Wikipedia of an executive order. An executive order is an institution, excuse me, is an instruction to the people in the executive branch on how to carry out the law or their duties. That's it. Because the separation of powers, the president can't force Congress or the judiciary branch to do anything. And it's the same way in the states. The governor is the highest authority in the state. The president is the highest authority in the nation. And they make executive orders, and it is only for the executive branch, the people they have immediate control over, giving them instructions on how to carry out their duties. In other words, no governor, no mayor, not even the president can go directly to the people and f tell them to do something and have force behind it. Because you know what you call that? Laws. And only the Congress can make laws. So an executive order means that a governor can do whatever he wants to in the state, in the executive branch, to tell his essential, essentially employees what he wants. But we have taken this and made it to the idea that a, a governor can shut down a whole state 
Gavin Newsom in California, you hear all the time, he shut down the state and the people don't say anything. He has no authority to do that. All he can do is say what's going to happen in the executive branch in the state of California. It's relevant only to them. And yet the people think that this is so. It's an abysmal ignorance as far as how our country, our country is to operate and how our government's supposed to operate and about the Constitution, whether it's the state or the federal Constitution. They just think, well, they said we've got to do it, and so they think they, that that's necessary that they do. Many government and mayors have used this crisis to become tyrants who oppress the people and Congress does nothing. The government of Michigan banned joint replacements and buying plants and seeds, but approves of abortion, lotto tickets, and marijuana, just to name a few. And the people came out, I saw it on the internet, by the thousands to the uh, to the state capitol to where the you know the lawmakers are and so forth, and they were showing their their protest that they they didn't want to be micromanaged by someone that has um, visions of grandeur, thinking that they're uh, somebody that can do anything they want to. And I'm talking about the governor of Michigan. Whitmer, I think is her name, and her response to all these people says, well, they're not minding me. I might have to double down and make this uh, go longer. The, the, out of thin air, the things that she said that you cannot do. Now, the people, remember, and the only way she could do that is through an executive order, and I'll just explain what an executive order is. Listen very carefully because these few points I want to make are bedrock. The U.S. Constitution applies in good times and in bad times. There is no exemption for a pandemic. You can look till your eyes drop out. You won't find it. There is no emergency provision in it that would change anything in the Constitution or subordinate it to anything. There is no emergency provision in it. Our God-given rights are guaranteed in it. Period. And when you talk to people in, in government and they're doing all these things and you ask them what authority do you have to do that, well, we've got a, we got a pandemic. We got to do something. Yeah, what you need to do is obey the Constitution and quit treating the people like they're children and give them the freedom and the opportunity to act as they will. Every American has the right to tell the government or any government official to go to hell if they want to without any repercussions whatsoever. That's enshrined in the First Amendment. The right to peaceably assemble, even if you want to peaceably assemble to trash a government official, that is enshrined in the First Amendment. Every government employee, every person that is in the military, in government, whether it's federal, state, or local, take an oath to the including uh, to the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights. The orders from government officials who command us to stay indoors. And they think, oh, this is all scientific. Well, MIT just did a study and said that the worst place you can be in a pandemic like this is indoors. 
And, they, and we have governors say, if you go outside, we'll arrest you. There was a guy out in the surf by himself, nobody in sight. And the officers went down there, told him to come in, arrested him, got right close to him, touched him, put cuffs on him, and hauled him out to, uh, off to jail. And the media was applauding it. And the monster that made this supposedly an edict that everyone has to obey was gloating about it. So this study says that when you go outside, you have fresh air, you have the breeze, you have all this. And in fact, they have some percentages. They said 80% of the cases recorded came who caught this virus were indoors, 80%. 40% of cases uh, were contracted on public transportation. So we're not getting correct information. And the reason I'm taking this very important time to tell you this is to embolden you. You don't have to know statutes and the law, all these type of things. All you have to know Basically, in order to keep people from infringing upon your God-given rights is what I've been telling you just the last few times. The Constitution and the laws made pursuant thereof is the supreme law of the land. You don't get any higher than that. And it has to be specifically stated for the rights that the states did give, which actually is the people through the states, did give to the government, whether it's state or federal, are very defined and specific. So what I'm saying is, it looks like we are at a point where, where we're getting past this virus. Only God knows what's going to happen. And people have been so focused on that and they've been so willing to listen to the government in the plans that they make that they shut down their homes, they shut down their businesses. And millions of people in this country are without a way of providing for themselves and their family now. And they desperately want to get out. Another thing the news isn't showing is how many hot spots all over the country where people are, are marching on the state uh, state house, where, where the, on the Congress, the state congresses, and saying, we are not going to take this any longer. So we are at the brink in, brink in that way. And I don't tell you this, to, of course, to frighten you because I know you have enough doctrine you're not going to be afraid but if you have a chance to speak out boldly and when people are saying well we got to do what they say and you just ask them who is sovereign in this country who runs the show in this country and if they're honest they're going to say the government probably the federal government and they got it just as backwards as they say we are sovereign this country was founded upon the people being in control, and the government can't do anything without their consent. You tell people that today, and they think you're crazy. Well, I made another shot at it to encourage you and to help you to recognize the God-given freedoms that we have. And they're being ignored today, and... If the people don't hold them accountable, I can assure you that God will. And that's the message for those who would take upon themselves authority that they do not have. And it's become pervasive across the nation. Governors, mayors. But one thing is nice, there were four sheriffs in Michigan that said they would not enforce this idiocy from this uh, Governor w w Whitmer. They says, we took an oath to the Constitution and we take it seriously. And what you're doing would make us break our oath and we will not do it. 
We need thousands of sheriffs to do that same thing. Because they have the authority in the county. And if they're going to hold their oath, they're going to look after the people. But there's so many of them that don't understand that. Okay, we're going to shift gears now. And we're going to go back into our questions about grace, 21 tough questions about grace. And one of the things that we really dwelt on in this particular part of the questions about what is free grace, which we've been on about two or three times here, and something that I think is not emphasized enough, and that is assurance. If you don't have assurance that you are going to be with the Lord when you die, if you're questioning, if you have any questions about, am I, am I able to go to heaven? I mean, am I qualified? I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I've sinned too much. I don't know if I've done enough divine good. That's why the gospel has to be precise that it is faith alone in Christ alone. God gets all the glory. Christ did all the work. And any time that you try to insert an element of work of any kind, bam, your assurance is gone. Because how can you know how much work is going to be enough? In fact, we know the Bible says, like in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that it's not of works. Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 6, To the one who does not work, but believeth in him who justifies the ungodly, the godly, the ungodly, excuse me, his faith is credited as righteousness. You know, the verse after verse after verse, and it's given as a gift. We know all of these things. But one reason I'm impressing this on you this evening is so it, you, you will be impressed with it. And every time you're talking to someone and they say something that smacks of, of, of works or something that is not according to grace, you don't want to just jump on them and, and make, a, uh, make them uncomfortable. But you need to stick on that and uh, uh, somehow bring them around to see what grace really is. Because every Christian will say, oh, yeah, I believe in grace. I'm saved by grace. Oh, well, that's great. So you didn't have to be baptized or be faithful in going to church or do any sacraments. You don't have to do any of those. Oh, well, yeah, you got to do those. They don't have, have an inkling what grace is really about. And so... Those people who believe that you have to have something other than just simply faith alone in Jesus Christ, then they have no assurance. And we're talking about the great huge numbers of people, even those who profess being Christians. Y'all remember Paul Reznicek? Talked to him the other day. And he was so great, even when he was when he was here around Brenham, he would go around to people and he's constantly giving the gospel. And he said he looked kind of dejected one day. I said, What's the matter? He said, Well, he said the churches had a big um outing in the park. The park was right across from where he lives. And so we he went in there and I don't know any hundreds of people out there, and it was all sponsored by churches. And he goes go up to people and he says, Say, uh, can you tell me how to go to heaven? And he says, maybe one in 20 would have some idea. Someone would just have to say, I don't know. And these are churchgoers. And, and he, or he would say, are you going to heaven when you die? And they say, I hope so. Does that sound like that's assurance there? How can you be a dynamic servant of Jesus Christ, if you don't have assurance, and when someone asks you, are you going to heaven when you die, and you say, you're damn right I am. There's no question whatsoever. And it doesn't have anything to do with me. It has to do with God's grace and His plan. I received the free gift of eternal life 
by faith alone. And I stand on that. And I have no equivocation about it. When you ask a, answer a question like that, people are going to be, uh, they're just going to be blown away. Because they're used to, oh, I don't know, I hope to, all this mini mouth thing. We're prefacing all that, so we are now going to get into the next little part here. Free grace glorifies God. And the, under this heading is the value of the cross. Now, I know you all know the value of the cross. Without the cross, we would have no salvation. You know that. But this is going to bring out a few nuances that I think that we need to remember and have them at the ready to use. So here we go. The value of the cross. As the Lord our God nailed to a wooden cross, took his final few breaths on that side of his resurrection, he said, it is finished. Now that's John 19.30. Now let's just stop there for a moment. You've all heard this. I know you you know that it's there in uh, John. Maybe you didn't know the chapter and verse. But he said, it is finished. Do you know that you could use that as a powerful witnessing tool? Because people that profess to be Christians, and yet they're not sure they're saved, because in their mind they have something yet they have to do which means it wasn't finished on the cross. So if you're talking to someone, it doesn't matter who they are, and you get to the subject matter about the cross, you might ask them, did you know that Jesus Christ said it is finished on the cross? Don't go into a big dissertation at that time. Ask them, what does that mean? Ask them, see, they have to think. <clears throat> Excuse me. And ask them, what does that mean to you? You don't know what they're going to say, but it's pretty simple to understand, isn't it? It is finished. You might ask them, what is the it? When we said it is finished, what was he talking about? And see, that's how you engage them. And they have to think that's what you're trying to get them to do. And they might say, well, is it salvation? Bingo! He He finished it. When he... He took his, when he took his last breath, by the way, he, they didn't kill him. He had the power to breathe his last, and it wasn't suicide in the way that some people think. His mission was completed, and they didn't kill him, even though they did their best. When he said, but before he, before he expired, he said, it is finished. There's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing you can take away from it. God's plan was completed with regards to the barrier that was between man and God when Jesus Christ said it was finished. It was finished. There's nothing else that has to be done. I was thinking about how that would be a really interesting question to a Catholic. If you're talking to a Catholic and they they have the sacraments and they have to do all these things. Listen, I don't know how the Catholic Church, I get, uh, uh, get so many people and how they keep them. Because really, they have a crummy, crummy theology. I mean, here, here's what they have to do. I mean, I, some of the things they have to do. They have to be baptized as a child, they have to be christened, and um, then they have to uh, go to Mass regularly. Uh, they They can't do any... Uh, sin that is, uh, what is this, a venial sin? What's the other one? Uh, um, a, a worse sin. I can't think of what it is. And they got to think about, I got to get to that priest and I have to acknowledge this sin to him. I have to confess this sin to him. I hope I don't get hit by a bus and run over by it before I get there. I mean, all these things that they have to do, and, and, and with, even if you do everything right down to dotting every I, crossing every T, you've done everything, you still don't have assurance because there's this thing uh, uh, called, um, what is it? The, uh, I had it in my mind just a minute ago. Purgatory. Now you've got to go into purgatory and you've got to suffer there, depending on how bad you were or what, or what all you did, 
until you're ready then to be accepted. How does that fit with this simple? It is finished. Ask him, how does, how does all those things you say measure against Christ saying it's finished? If it's finished, it's, you don't have to add it. You don't have to do anything else to it, does it? Look for these kind of very simple things. And when you're talking to people that do not have assurance, and anybody that, uh, even those that say, yes, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, but they say, I hope I get to heaven, I'm not sure about this, I'm not sure about that, it is finished. I just thought I would emphasize that to you. Maybe you will think about it next time you're talking to someone, and they say, well, you have to be baptized, or you have to uh, keep going to church, and if you do this sin, then that's, that's blather. He had borne all of the sins of mankind, and his work was done. God was satisfied, and no one could, no more could sin separate anyone from him. Period. That's what I said. The barrier was moved permanently. And when people think of heaven, most people, you know, the first thing they think, I hope I'm good enough. Am, am I good enough to do it, or am I not good enough to do it? And they don't know that people, I hope that y'all do this sometimes when people are equivocating about sin and you just blurt out, hey, nobody goes to hell for sin. <sighs> you might have to revive them. They might get the vapors. They, they, that's got to be sacrilege. That's got to be heretical. They've never heard that before. I've told people that before and they've said, and they and they did. I thought they was going to get the vapors right there in front of me. And I said, right, let me ask you one question. If you can go to hell for your sins, then Christ must have failed on the cross, didn't he? Or else he made a wasted trip. And and they and, and I see it. It's so wonderful. They it registers with them. They think it's the first time, and that's not big deep theology. That's just logical, common sense. Sin was taken away by the power of his precious shed blood. The value of his blood in God's eyes is more than sufficient. It is infinite. Now, you notice it says his precious shed blood. We don't, I'm not going to have time to get in it tonight. I might do it next time. But he, this, this author talks about the blood of Christ two or three times in here. And I want to make sure you've got the right understanding about that. Because a lot of people do not. They think it has something to do with Christ's literal blood and it has some kind of mysterious, miraculous uh, entity to it. Jesus' death for the sins of the world includes our sins, all of them, not just some of them, it includes the little ones, the big ones. Come on. There. The unspeakable ones. The cruel ones. If you were here, I know what I would be doing. I would be saying, quit playing poker. Quit playing like you're shocked about that you have committed unspeakable or cruel sins. If you're breathing, you've done that. All were nailed to the cross with our Savior, every sin that was ever committed by any person ever. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This kind of light pink color I have on here is Scripture. When you see that, it means it's Scripture. I'm very limited on what I can do to these texts, and so that's how I'm showing you that this is Scripture. Now, what's so sort of significant about that? Look, who was John the Baptist, by the way? He was Jesus' cousin. And he knew that Jesus was really somebody. But when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, he was recognizing him as Messiah. And he said this after he was baptized, and God the Father had already pronounced him 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when he says that this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. How many lambs, how many millions of animals were sacrificed prior to that time? We don't know how many. We Way in the millions. But not one animal could ever take away the sins of the world. All they could do is cover them. All they could do is put God's wrath on those sins on hold until the real Lamb of God, who was perfect, came and took away the sins of the world. Likewise, Paul wrote, quote, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 3b through 4, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3b through 4. And then we have Romans 4, 25. And he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Two things going there. He Again, he was delivered up for our trespasses on the cross and when he rose from the grave, it was for our justification. When Jesus Christ rose from the grave, it, grave, it was a demonstration that God had accepted his atonement. It was a way that God then could justify us. And we are justified because God the Father recognized that Jesus Sacrifice on the cross propitiated God the Father. It satisfied God the Father, and therefore we are justified because he was the only and the perfect sacrifice. The Apostle John wrote, He is the propitiation, that is the satisfactory payment for our sins. Who is our <laughs> Who are the ones that are encompassed in the word for our sins? Everybody's ever been born. Because Christ paid that price for all of them. There's no partiality because we are all dead in sin. And that's 1 John 2 2. What it does, well, I didn't finish the verse. He is a satisfactory payment, the propitiation for ours, and not for ours only. Now, he's talking about not for ours, the, the ones that he were talking to, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the entire or the whole world. Now, do you think anybody could twist that around to say it really isn't for the whole world? It seems like it would be hard to do, and it is hard to do, but some people do it. They say that Jesus Christ prayed for the sins of, the whole, uh, of all types of sins for the whole world. All types of people. But it's not all inclusive, not every sin. You've heard this one before. In short, the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You hear that in communion, don't you? That's Isaiah 53, 6b. When we rightly value the cross of Christ, we see that his death has satisfied God's justice. See, that's what made it so unbelievably hard for Christ to pay for our sins because God did not cut him any slack. He didn't diminish his suffering in the slightest. Even when he's screaming over and over, my God, my God, why has I forsaken me? He just kept pouring it to him because he had to be righteous and just. So, when we rightly value 
the cross of Christ, we see that his death has satisfied God's justice. God cannot overlook sin, and he could diminish sin that he poured out on the Lord. I think that maybe the only thing, this isn't, this isn't diminishing it, but he had darkened the earth at that point in time so those who were mocking and gaggling and giggling and cursing him, they couldn't see anymore. But they could hear him cry out over and over. But because Christ died for the sins of the world, sin no longer separates man from God. That would be a good question to ask people, isn't it? That are sure still trying to figure out how many sins balancing across the good things they did. How do their good works and deeds uh, balance out? And some people are deadly serious about that because they think that there's going to come a day what they say at the last judgment. They don't, they're not specific at all. They don't know. And they think at the end of time, God is going to judge a person whether they're going to heaven or hell based upon whether their good works outweigh their sins. And if their sins outweigh their good works, they're going to the smoking section. But if their good works outweigh their sins, then they're going to the no smoking section. Ludicrous. God cannot overlook sin. It would be unrighteous for him to do so. But because Christ died for the sins of the world, sin no longer separates man from God. If they did, then Christ failed. Because Christ bore the sins of the world, God can offer justification and eternal life as a free gift. In fact, it's the only way that he gives justification and eternal life as a free gift. Christ's death was to show God's righteousness at the present time so that we might be just and the just that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is Romans 3:26. Now I wish they didn't have that break there, but let's look at that again. Christ's death was to show God's righteousness. See, he had to pour out everyone's sins to the fullest measure for him to demonstrate his righteousness. If he pulled back a little bit because he, it was his only or uniquely born son that he loved more than we can even imagine, if he were withdrawn it just a little bit, he would no longer be righteous. Not perfectly righteous. So God, Christ's death was to show God's righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just, first of all, he had to be, he had to pour it out completely on him, that he might be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The only reason that we can be justified when we have faith is because God the Father was just in pouring out in full measure our sins to him. Because Christ died as a full, satisfactory payment for our sins, God is not unjust to declare us righteous when we believe in Jesus. A lot of people say, well, believe, what's that? That's nothing. They try to say, in fact, John MacArthur calls it easy believism. And he says, that's fake. That's, you've got to really suffer. Well, why do we have to suffer for our sins? Didn't Christ suffer for our sins and say it is finished? The only reason that God can declare us just and him not be unjust because at the cross God poured out him on him completely and then totally every single solitary sin that anybody has ever committed. What if he we, what we said, well... I, this is so hard. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to back off 1%. It's too hard for me to pour it out in full because he's suffering. I'm just going to back off 1%. Would he be righteous? He wouldn't be perfect righteous, would he? Would he be just? No, he wouldn't be perfectly just. 
And because he didn't back off, and because he was just in the way that he handled the atonement, the sacrifice of Christ, because he was just in that, now he is just in pronouncing us justified. I think we'll stop there. You see, I think sometimes I, that I know the things that I'm telling you, you've heard before. But sometimes when you slow down and you're not just saying it, you're embellishing on it. You're explaining why it is so part, important and how these verses, like the one in uh, John 19, that you can say, it is finished. What does that mean to you? Do you believe that? Do you believe it is finished? What are they going to say? But they probably would say, well, he said it. Yeah, I believe it's finished. Then why do you still believe in works? Why do you still, you still think you have to be baptized? Why do you still think you have to go to church? Or that you can lose your baptism, but your, your, uh, your eternal life by any little old thing? Okay, well, it's time to close, so let's do it. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. It is so deep and so rich and so wonderful. Some people have to make themselves read the Bible or even listen to it. They have a long ways to go to understand what truth is. They have a long ways to go to have any capacity to appreciate who you are, what you've done, and that you have revealed this, these wonderful things. Our lives depend on the accuracy and the truth of your word and your promises. We were talking about how important assurance is. And assurance is in not what we do, but in what you say. Your promises. Everything hinges on your veracity. And everything hinges on our faith that we believe your promises. So we pray that you will help us during these trying times and everybody is going around and a lot of them are in a dither. We should be calm and cool and collected. We should be looking for opportunities to engage people, and just talk to them, find out what's going on, and then ask them if they knew that Jesus Christ said it was finished on the cross, and what does that mean to them? Whatever. I mean, the Holy Spirit helps us in this. But we pray that you will motivate us to whoever it is not to be intimidated and be humble and with love give them the, the mighty promises the principles and precepts, the security and the courage, all the things that they want are there. And we know that you will do it. And we thank you already for answering this prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.